All right. Hey, everybody. Um, we are getting started a minute early because I know we've got the new uh, Eventbrite system um, that doesn't have like a waiting room. So we're just making sure everybody is uh, is able to get on right on time. Um, so I actually see we have a lot of people here already. That's great. I'm watching the numbers go up. Uh, what I'll do, and it's noon now. Um, so what I'm going to do is just take a minute or two to go over some information for anybody who might be new. Uh, for those of you who have been attending uh, these classes for a while, welcome back. We're happy you're here today. Uh, for any of you guys who are new, this is a Zoom webinar format. So it's a little bit different than a Zoom meeting if you haven't attended a webinar before. Um, if you have questions during the class, you're gonna hit that Q&A box on your Zoom menu and you can send questions to me that way. I'll be monitoring that, and I'm also setting the chat now so that you guys can send me chats. If you have any issues, I will be monitoring the chat box as well. Um, it's just a little bit more difficult to monitor questions coming in through there, so try and send those to the Q&A section. Um, let me see. I think that about covers it. Uh, we're recording today. Um, for any of you guys who are, who are joining us for the first time since we switched to Eventbrite, we're sending our follow-up emails now through Eventbrite as well, uh, which should help us bypass for those of you who had like Verizon or AOL uh, and were having trouble getting our previous emails. You guys should all be getting those emails now. I think when they show up, they come from my name, but it might say Eventbrite. So just be aware of that. Um, all right. I think that's it for the announcements on my end. Uh, we have Paul McLean with us today. He's gonna be talking about citrus and minor tropicals, which as a Floridian is near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm looking forward to, <laughs> to hearing from Paul today uh, and, uh, and learning all the information that I can about this. Um, Paul, let me see, what else should I share? Paul uh, works at our Fair Oaks store primarily for those of you uh, who wanna go visit him after class. Paul, I'm gonna um, hand things over to you if you wanna tell everybody a little bit about what you do and, and then we can get started. Okay, um, so, so I'm Paul McLean. I have been here almost 20 years. Uh, I'm originally from California, Northern California. I went to school in a beautiful place called uh, San Luis Obispo at California Polytechnic State University. And I studied horticulture and fruit science. Um, anyway, and so um, I like citrus. It was one of the first things I actually grew were seeds. You know, you eat an orange and there's a seed in it and you plant it out. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, got a lot of stuff to talk about. Hopefully we'll get through it. If not, oh well, we'll live. So we're gonna start out right now. I've got a little presentation I wanna go through kind of quickly and then we can go from there, okay? There we go, hopefully. So that's me, just a picture of a lot of different fruits. Um, some that are easily recognizable, um, not all, well, they can all grow in the tropics. Um, but, you know, pineapple, papaya, bananas, um, and citrus, and some dates, but we're going to keep going. Um, this I got, um, I'm from one of these people, this is from Four Winds Nursery, they're out in California, they do ship, um, they have a nice website, and they grow a lot of different things. So we do have quite a few different citrus here. Um, um, but if you're looking for something more unusual, um, there there'd be a good source. But you can find stuff also on the internet. Um, just be aware that certain places can't ship to um, other states. But I think Virginia's fine because it's not a citrus growing um, environment. So um, this is just talking about um, ideally the conditions you want to grow your plants in. Um, ideally, you can see. Um, 65 degrees at night. I mean, during the day is great or warmer, um, five degrees lower. You want to keep your soil evenly moist to slightly moist, not, don't really want to go bone dry and don't want to keep it wet. Um, use a well drained potting soil. Um, and I'll show you some stuff um, in a bit, um, but I'm going to go through the slides real quick. Um, when you plant, you, there are certain um, things that can be used directly for citrus and such, but you can also add, make your own. Um, as you said, you want to use porous inorganics, perlite, vermiculite, expanded shale, 
Um, permatil and hydrate are two forms of that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there. Sand is okay, but sand isn't porous, meaning that the particle is not porous. It's sand has porosity between the particles, but not in the particles. All these other things, perlite, vermica, expanded shale, and clay have porosity inside, like a sponge. And that's what you're really looking for. Um, half day sunlight's minimum. Uh, they can go directly in front of a window. Um, and as things go on, you want to acclimate them if you're going to put them outside. Um, you want to put them in some shade at first and then slowly bring them out in more full sun. They love it here in Virginia, Northern Virginia stuff. Um, we kind of have a subtropical summer here. Um, and do real well. And um, if, when they flower for you here, the insects will do their job. But if you keep them indoors, you're going to have to be the insect. And we'll get to that too. Um, neem oil is a great product to use to control insects. It is also a miticide and a fungicide. Hopefully you'll never have any fungus. The second cell so will work too. Those are nice, easy things. I like neem oil because you can ingest neem oil easily and it won't bother you. Um, some people make a tea of it to help get rid of um, internal parasites. Uh, using a citrus or acid fertilizer um, is a great thing to use. Uh, there's lots of different products out there. Um, so, you know, we have multiple products to use here or your local nursery, okay? Um, these are guavas. Um, not really widely available um, in the northern climates, but um, you can pick them up down south or you can grow them from here. You can buy them in the store and grow them from seed. They come, a lot of them come true from seed. Um, it's a fun, they're fun to have. Um, and there's different kinds. You've got your true guavas in the upper corners. And um, the center picture here shows true guavas, the big ones. And then as in the middle picture down below, this is a strawberry guava. That's a little more cold hardy, smaller fruit than um, the, what we call the true guava. Um, in the, in the, to the right of that, you'll see a yellow one. That I'm see a yellow strawberry guava. <laughs> and then over to the left is something called a pineapple guava. It is related to true guavas. They're in the same family, but they're a completely different plant, tastes completely different. In true guavas and the strawberry guavas and stuff, you have, they have hard seeds, but they're on some of the true guavas, they have soft seeds that you can just ingest. And you can see that um, ideally they want to grow in zones nine through 10. We happen to be seven. The Fihoa, or now called Akia, is a zone eight to 10. So that means if you're down by Virginia Beach or lower, you could actually grow these outdoors. Up here, you could possibly grow them outdoors. The thing you'd want to do, the um, pineapple guava, is you don't want to cover the ground up in late fall dense. I usually recommend putting unopened bags of something fertilizer, I mean uh, mulch or potting soils. And that'll help insulate the ground if it gets really cold and you can just cover the plant up when it gets cold. Um, and you could possibly, our winters predominantly are not zone seven for the last 20 years. We've only had five years that they've been zone seven. All the other years have been zone eight. These are papaya. Um, you have more of a traditional papaya on the left, and then there's one on the right um, is um, a baco papaya or the mountain papaya. Um, you don't see that in the store very often, but I did grow papayas from seed and I uh, put them in my yard um, well into May, and they did really nicely. They looked neat. Um, I liked the foliage, but that's all they were. They did start to flower late in the season, um, but of course, I didn't get any fruit. I did have experience when I was in high school growing one of these in a pot, and um, it was an area where I couldn't grow it outside in the wintertime. I had it inside and in my bedroom, and um, by early January, it fell over like um, Paul Bunyan cut it down from the base, and it, what happened was the soil stayed too cool, and the roots literally just rotted away because it stayed very cold. So papayas need a very warm soil. So if you're gonna grow papayas in a container, you might actually use a heating mat underneath it in the wintertime to keep the soil warm. And that can be used for any of your, um, if you want to experiment with subtropicals and tropicals. But these are pineapples, of course. We do sell a, a pineapples here occasionally and they're always mini pineapples. They're not gonna get very big to fruit. <laughs> um, 
They're fun to grow. Um, the pineapples, if you buy pineapple at the store, it's a special variety that has soft foliage, not pointy. Commercially, <clears throat> pineapples have um, points on the tips that could penetrate your body if you fell into one. So that's why they have a special one. And we'll talk about pineapples a little bit later. Good old bananas. Um, there are uh, lots of dwarf mini bananas now that you can keep in pots and grow. <clears throat> and um, you could very easily get fruit, but you definitely want to um, uh, have it in the wintertime inside the house. There is a banana that can grow here um, and will come back on its own, but it's not an edible banana. It's a fiber banana. It's a Japanese fiber banana they use it to make rough clothing, string, line, and netting. Um, or just for ornamental purposes. The, the fruit is just full of seeds, um, and so there's nothing to eat. You can use the leaves though to cook with. So these are, I put this in here, these are semi-tropical fruit trees, and a lot of you can grow here. Um, the Japanese persimmon, it really doesn't like it much below seven. Um, the loquats, Japanese loquats, um, ideally eight. But fudge factor, if you're in Alexandria, in a courtyard, you could probably get away with it. I've talked to some people that have them. And again, going back to the fact that you might just need to cover it up on our cold winters and insulate the ground. Pomegranates, um, again, to zone seven, um, but not below in normal conditions. Um, date palms, fun, but <clears throat> they get huge. And again, um, probably not practical. Figs, they are root hardy to at least some six, um, but they die down the ground. Here, they're usually a big bush because they get killed back every, periodically. And Jabota cabas, that's a rare one. That's from Brazil. It's an interesting thing. Um, again, you probably would never find the fruit up here. They'd have to be flown up real quick. But they look like grapes and they grow on the, uh, actually the trunks and branches of the tree. So here's your olive. We do sell olives here, and we do sell the hardy, the hardiest one here. Um, it's a Spanish variety. Um, so again, it could actually grow down in Virginia Beach or lower. Um, so um, again, insulating the soil, um, wrapping the plant um, in a protected wind area could work very well. And then these are Japanese persimmons. Your uh, fuyu types are the types that are the flat, not astringent, and you can eat them once they're ripe and they'll be firm. Um, and there's several kinds. The Jiro and the Emoto are the ones we carry here mostly. There's a slight difference in them. And then we carry the Haichia mainly. That is the more heart-shaped one. That is where it has to soften before you eat it. My mom could not wait until they softened on the tree in California, which they would. And so as soon as they started turning orange in September, because you wouldn't normally eat them off the tree until close to November, she would take them and put them in the freezer to freeze it, which would get rid of the astringency, and then she'd bring it out, and she couldn't wait for it to defrost, so she'd pop it in the microwave a little bit, and then she'd eat it. So the astringency on persimmons disappears with cooking, drying, or freezing. So it's the Haichia astringent types that are used to make uh, the wonderful cookies and cakes that I used to use, eat as a kid um, after church. And then there's your loquat. Um, they have a fuzzy little fruit that looks like kind of like an apricot, and then big brown seeds inside. Um, the plant is cold hardy down definitely to zone eight, but the flowers bloom very early and they're, they get damaged at around 28 degrees. So that would be a big concern here. Um, the, and there are the orange is the predominantly color, but there are some white varieties, and that would be the main varieties. But again, <laughs> I've grown them here from seed, um, and you know, they're, I like the plant. It's a, a pretty plant, nice texture, um, but I never got it to fruit. And of course, there's a pomegranate, sorry. Um, good choice here. They want maximum sun, heat, um, more of a dry spot. Um, and they would better have to have such a dry spot where you might have to water it once in a while, but they'll do fine with our rainfall there, but they like extra heat. They are from the Mediterranean. And so the more heat they get, um, the better off. The commercial production in, in the United States is mainly in the San Joaquin Valley where eh, we get temperatures easily 90s, 100 degrees while they're ripening. So, and we do sell those here. And then here is the date palm on the right. 
but I put in this other one, the Budia capitata, uh, called the pindu palm or whatever, and it stays smaller. And the flesh on the fruit is edible. I did talk to a guy that has some out in the Shenandoah somewhere, and he says they do fruit for him. Um, so um, again, that is a zone nine plant, possibly zone eight. So by um, you can take the if anybody's ever been to the beaches, particularly on the eastern shore, you sometimes you see palm trees over there. And what they've done is they wrap them up in burlap. The whole fronds is pointing straight up. That helps protect the fronds in the winter time. Um, the trunk many times will survive the temperatures, but the fronds will burn out. That's why they wrap them. And they're good old fig in a pot. And then down here is a picture of lots of different types of figs. You've got your, your darker figs, black figs, brown figs, green, white figs. We sell a lot of figs here and they're, they're easy to, they have almost no insect issues. Um, you do have to watch for birds if you let them ripen on the tree, but usually you'll pick them before the birds get to them. And they can be pruned very hard. Um, you can take all the branches off the fig tree and it'll flush out and fruit for you the next year. So no issues there on, on size. And that's it for our slides. Hopefully everybody enjoyed that. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can maybe add a Sally and she can pop in, but I'm gonna show you some different things here. My first thing I wanna do is have fun. And here's a pineapple. I don't know if anybody of you have grown a pineapple yourself besides buying the plant possibly here. But if you wanted to grow one at home, all you have to do is take it and you twist the top off, throw the fruit away, unless you want to eat it. And then what you want to do is you want to tear off the bottom leaves of the pineapple pop to expose the stem. And if there's any fleshy part left at the base here, you want to cut this off. And there's already, I don't know if you can see them, there's already roots forming here on this plant. Commercially, when they harvest pineapples, um, they will separate the top from the bottom for canning or freezing. And they toss the top into a conveyor belt that goes off into a truck. And then that truck dumps it somewhere on the property. And those pineapple tops just sit there on the ground in a big pile until they want to replant in the field. Then they scoop them up with a big bucket truck, haul them out to the field, and then they stick them in the ground. And so this can, after you peel off this, cut off the bottom here, the fleshy part. Um, and you can just take this and stick it on top of the refrigerator room. You can put it in your window still if you want and just leave it there for a week or two or more. And then, then you just put in some um, nice well-drained potting soil and it will start to root off and grow for you. Uh, when I was in college, a friend of mine did this. And of course it was in San Luis Obispo where it doesn't get very cold, um, but he did get it actually to flower and fruit for him. What are the light needs for I'm that? Sorry. I'm sorry? Can you do that? Like what kind of light does that need? Could you oh. do that? They like sunlight. That, okay. Commercially, they're grown out in full sun. Okay. So, um, Got to remember that when you're growing things uh, that are going to have flowers and fruit, uh, you may have a plant and it grows, but it never flowers. And that just means it's not getting enough sunlight. So the flowering and then especially fruiting takes extra energy. The leaves are there to make energy for the plant and to grow but they've got to get enough energy from the sunlight to make extra energy to produce flowers and then also produce the fruit. Okay, okay. So pineapple, all these little uh, diamond chip things, those are actual individual fruits. This is a multiple fruit. So if you've ever taken a pineapple and when you peel it, you notice underneath, you see these little, you can still see sort of the triangle areas and then there's a, a little hole in the center. That's because each one of these is an individual female flower. So just sidebar on that, okay? Um, so I was gonna talk about um, soils. We, where'd it go? We sell this cactus mix, but it's also for use for um, citrus and other things. So it's just a really well, you want a well-drained soil. The larger the container, the more coarser material you wanna have in it. Um, our regular Merrifield potting soil um, is good. I have a sample here, but of course, you're probably not going to be able to see it very well. But it's got the white little things in here. That's the perlite. It's got big pieces, nice chunky pieces of uh, bark. That's all going to act as um, drainage material. The bark will absorb water, but also has airspace, so sponge-like product. Perlite 
is just more of an air product. They doesn't really absorb a lot of water, but creates airspace. But you're gonna the, the the larger the container, the more chunky material. So you can also get this is one of our orchid barks, um, and it's some of it's quite large. That could be mixed into our regular potting soil if you want, or a potting soil of your choice to increase space, airspace. And if you're kind of making your own, adding some activated charcoal. Okay, uh, so it's not it's not stuff that you're going to, um, you know, not briquettes and stuff, but you want horticultural activated charcoal. That will help keep soil from souring. The other thing is that some of the soils, and the cactus mix has it, some other soils has expanded shale, and this is going to be hard to see. I'm going to show you some other examples, hopefully. But it it looks like a little rock, but it's like um, pumice. It's got airspace inside of it. And some of our different mixes have it, but you can also buy it. A similar product here is our bowl block. Back in the small bag. And you can see it's kind of looks like rock pebbles. It is, but it's got space. The bigger bag is called Permatil. You're going to get a lot of it. And depending where you go or here, we got this little bag in the greenhouse. And this is also a um, expanded um, rock, which has um, airspace in it. Um, the another thing you can use this is um, cocoa chips core. It's the husk of a coconut, and um, this is the chunky material. You add water to this. This makes one point three gallons of material. So you you could take this and mix it with. Um, a standard potting soil to add airspace. What else we got? Um, and of course, we sell various charcoals, bigger bags, small bags. The fertilizers. We do have special fertilizers for citrus. You can also use your standard acid mix. Or if you like fish and mulch, and that one would work well too. It's really your choice. So you've got um, here. We've got liquid forms. These are granulated forms. People ask me what's the best one, and I always tell people that the one that you're actually going to use as directed is going to be the best fertilizer for your plant, as long as you're getting something that is for that, you know, particular plant. Is we also carry this jacks in a citrus. Um, blend but we're apparently sold out of it right now so um but this is the liquid form when you do liquid fertilization the mistake a lot of people make is oh my gosh i need to water my plant so oh i need to fertilize this plant. so let me let me do that at the same time never fertilize liquid fertilize a plant that needs water it's going to suck it up too fast and you can burn it so if your plant needs water go ahead and water it and wait about 12 hours or so and then you can come back and add the liquid fertilizer to that plant. Um, but never never use a liquid fertilizer on a dry plant. The exception is probably fish emulsion because that's an organic and it's really slow release in there anyhow. So that would work fine. Um, I did bring up these. There's always supplements you can use. Oyster shell, this adds calcium and calcium is very good for fruit production. Um, I example on tomatoes or peppers with uh, squash. If you ever have brown bottoms of where the blossoms are and it's browned out, that's called blossom um, blight and it's a lack of calcium in the fruit. This is azomite and that has a lot of trace minerals that can be used on anything. And your tropical subtropical plants are a little heavier feeders on micronutrients and that's one thing you can add to a regular potting soil. Um, I brought this up. This is our Espoma bonsai mix, and that has uh, a lot of this expanded shale in it. Um, very well fast draining, and you could actually, if you want, buy this and maybe mix it with a potting soil or even grow it directly in it. So, this is a new product that I saw in a fertilizer. It is um, lobster kelp and worm castings. Um, all those things are great. You're adding calcium. Um, celebrities, nutrients, micronutrients from all those products, uh, and it's approved for organic gardeners. So, 
Paul, can I ask you a question? And I just realized I'm not sure the best way to answer this myself, so I've got to ask, but are we, Northern Virginia is generally zone seven? Yes. Okay. We are definitely zone seven, but we're not there very often. Like I said, uh, I've been here almost 20 years in 2004, 15, 16, 17, and I think we might have, I don't even think we reached this December. We got cold, but I don't think we got below 10 degrees this winter yet. Yeah, that's pretty amazing that it spans what you can grow. I will, I'm going to add, just because I know we have someone on the call from Nova Scotia, and we've had people from kind of all over on our call lately. Um, you can go online and look up your garden zone if you're not sure of it. I'm not sure, Paul, like if you know of a good website to look at, but um, usually if you look up like Nova Scotia, what's my garden zones, you can find a map if you don't know. Um, just, yeah, shout out to our uh, Nova Scotian on the call. Um, okay, thank you. So um, a lot of people get worried about insects. Um, I really like neem oil. Um, it is a um, insecticide, uh, miticide, and a um, preventive fungicide. Hopefully you shouldn't have any real fungus issues on your citrus, um, but mites can be a problem, particularly indoors. Um, very important that when you um, over summer your plant outdoors, is to spray your plant at least twice before you bring it in, ideally, because you may not notice any insects on your plant outside because you've got fluctuating temperatures, you've got natural predators and such. All you need is one insect, female, to come inside the house and your house temperature is perfect for female sucking insects such as aphids and mealybug and thrips and spider mites, is they have the ability to, um, to give live birth to pregnant females. They don't have to have a male involved. And so if the temperature is just perfect, then they'll just keep pumping out um, more babies. Um, that will just make more babies. So spraying your plant before, and, and neem oil is organic. Um, I've talked to people that grew up with this, a gentleman out in Indonesia, and he remembers his grandmother using neem oil to make poultices to put on his scratches and wounds in the tropics to keep them from festering. You all call it neem oil and toothpaste to help gum disease and stuff. It is a compound sulfur product. That's why it is a miticide, a fungicide, and an insecticide. It's also an oil. So the oil, like horticultural oil or insecticidal soap, will kill existing soft-bodied insects and also is an oversight. What it means is that it will coat an egg, insect egg, and it'll suffocate it so they won't grow. But also the compound sulfur products if an insect lands or you miss spraying an insect and an insect crawls across your plant and comes in contact with the neem oil, when they clean themselves, they ingest it and the sulfur compounds will help take care of it. And All so, right. Yes. Awesome, good. Okay, so um, Paul, I've got a ton of questions coming in. I wanted, I wanted to ask you before we jump into these, cause I can see some of them are pretty, um, I'm just going to say like advanced for beginners who are on this call. Can you talk a little bit about like if they're thinking about trying to grow a lemon tree or a lime tree or anything indoors? What are the like, basic requirements to say, okay, this is going to give you fruit? Like how much light realistically do you need? You need at least four hours of direct sunlight. Okay. Ideally. Um, or if it's just really bright, intense sunlight. Now, for those people that are within our Plate of driving distance, which would be the entire world if you want to drive that far. We do carry um, citrus care guides, and then we do have a description of some of the citrus we carry. But it, basically, you want to have a um, good amount of sunlight, well drained soils. Don't let them dry out, don't want to keep them wet. I also brought this up. This is mosquito bits, because one of the things that happens in house plants, you get um, fungus gnats, the little tiny dark brown, black almost no seams and they fly around and pest you. And I'm then, finding that right now with my house plants. I told you I had the little banana. They've been in that, they're in everything. It's so <laughs> what this is, is corn nymphs, which is basically ground up corn cob and they impregnate it with a type of bacteria that has always been used to kill off mosquito lover, but it also takes care of um, fungus gnats. You just coat the soil with this stuff. And when you water, the bacteria goes into the soil, comes in contact with a little, maggot and they ingest it and bam they're dead 
Also, apparently, um, takes care of nematodes, but hopefully you don't have nematodes in your soils. But uh, this is great to, if you have a problem, to take care of your fungus nets. Um, for light, extra light, we have- yeah. Just if you don't get your four hours of sunlight? Well, yeah, or- uh, A little or beyond that. The thing that a lot of people make a mistake is, oh yeah, I, I have a plant light and I turn it on uh, in the after, in the evening when I come home from work, well, you should turn it on in the morning when you wake up and turn it off at night when you go to bed. You don't want to extend the light hours. You want to increase your light hours. You want to increase your, your foot count. So by turning it on during the day, when the plant gets the natural sunlight, you're increasing the light that is getting to where it's actually useful. So these are just examples, um, different bulbs. This is uh, a whole set. Um, so if you have a lamp that you can put it in, and if you notice this is a directional um, lamp, not just like a um, regular lamp, you want to have it directed right on the plant. So um, the I mentioned earlier that you may have to play um, pollinator. Oh, this smells great. I'm sure it does. <laughs> this is a, a ponderosa lime, which produces a really a lemon, which produces a really big, big lemon. Um, but it's flowering, and you can actually see these are the um, stigmas, the female part, and the little green fruits are forming. When you get flowering, you don't want every flower to turn into a fruit. Otherwise, you get a bunch of little tiny fruit, and the plant puts too much energy into something, and just won't do a good job. You probably only want one lemon to form on this. If you get multiple lemons on your developing, getting up the large size, you probably want to pick and just leave one. Remember when you're growing citrus in places that citrus don't normally grow, meaning a good portion of the United States where it gets too cold to keep them outside, it's more about having the plant and enjoying growing it and then going, wow, I got three fruits off my tree. If you're doing it, you're not going to make money doing it. You probably buy citrus cheaper in the store, but it's just the fun of doing it and having it. Yeah, I was talking to my mom about that, but with vegetables, we talked about this. Um, okay, so I buy my lime and I bring it home. I have my grow light set up. I see there's like 10 or 12 limes forming on that plant that you showed me that's pretty small. Do you just pull the little lime plants off and choose a few to keep growing? Is that how you handle that? Yeah. Okay. But you want to wait until they actually start getting about the size of a marble because what happens in almost all, fr all fruit trees is that plant realizes we've got too many or it looks like it's producing fruit but then some of those will just dehiss off they'll just fall off because they actually uh, weren't set properly okay okay don't do it when they're in flower don't do it when they're tiny little pea things you want to wait till they get about the size of the marble before you even think about taking anything off if you have to thin a crop because the okay. plant, plant may tend to thin itself Okay, okay. Um, can we talk for a second about pot, pot sizes and repotting? I actually have had a couple questions come in for customers, so I know there's some interest in that. Um, this, I'll read this you, this one person from about a Calamondin orange. I inherited a Calamondin orange that's been in the same pot for years, maybe decades. Should I refresh the soil? Do I keep using the citrus fertilizer? Do I need to repot it? Like, I guess my question would be like, how, do you know what the right size pot is? And then how often should you repot? Well, I get that question a lot, even for outdoor plants. People go, well, how long can I keep this plant in the pot? Yeah. And they ask them, you ever heard of bonsai is? <laughs> you can yes. bonsai a tray that's, you know, two inches deep and eight by eight. Yeah. What they're doing is they take the plant out of the pot periodically, depending on the plant, and they actually cut off the outside roots that are up against the pot. As long as the plant can keep putting out new roots, it's gonna put new top on. So obviously you don't want your citrus to get to full size because you don't want a 20 foot citrus plant in your house. And so you're gonna be pruning and pinching the growth as it grows. In fact, you, you will do that anyhow because a lot of times you'll have a citrus tree, a plant, lemon, lime, whatever, and it's putting out new growth and it grows out a foot, foot and a half. It's one branch growing out, you know, like this. And the rest of it's back here. What you want to do if you see something doing that as it goes out and go, okay, it's growing out and it's a whole foot out away from the rest of the plant, you would go out there and pinch the tip, maybe back a couple inches to stop it and then make a branch. So the more tips you have, the more potential of having more fruit. 
more fruits and more flowers. Yeah, you get bushy, like this little guy here, how bushy it is. And so you got a lot more tips where potential flowers are. Whereas the first one I have, this is your bigger, faster growing um, hunter of wine. Yeah. Fine, but, you know, you got this up here, it's not doing anything. So you could actually come back and prune it back to here or when it was growing, just pinch the tips off to make it stop and make it branch at that point to make it a fuller plant for yourself. Okay. So, What's the best time to actually do the pruning? The pruning would only, ideally you want to do it in act, when it's in active growth. If you're having an issue with uh, keeping it more compact, it's going to possibly delay flowering. But as you get more points, tips on it, the plant's going to diversify the energy into more growth points. And so it's going to help keep the plant smaller for you anyhow. So after time, it, you know, there's going to be some random um, water shoots that you might have to take care of after that. Okay. So okay. Pot size is all determining how big you want your plant to get. Okay. <laughs> and so we uh, had someone on a call the other day who had like a 30 foot, um, this isn't a fruit tree, but a ficus in their house. And, and, you know, I mean, it had this big pot, but it had just gotten massive. And I know fruit trees can obviously get pretty big too. So and um, you, you can always, you know, if, if you're all of a sudden you realize, my gosh, this has gotten way too big. You can always go back and, really cut the thing back hard. It'll reflush, pinch it, pinch it as it grows. Um, you could even decide, I don't want it to be in a, in a 20 inch pot. I want to put it back in a 16 inch pot. You would prune it back, take it out of the big pot, cut off a bunch of the roots in the soil and then put it in a smaller container. Oh, is there like a limit to how many of the roots you can cut before it's a problem? Well, you, need to do that? you don't want to cut it back to this stubs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, that's not where you're coming. More or less, more or most often, uh, you, you're going to want to keep it in the same size pot. Okay. And that means that if the plant's doing well, it's growing and you have to pinch it to keep it from getting too big and it's flowering and doing its thing, then it's fine. Um, you can, um, if it starts to like it's not growing as vigorously, then it's probably getting too root bound. You okay. Can, you can always. If you suspect it, you can always try taking, pulling the plant out and then looking at the roots. If the roots are starting to, to literally turn into a mat next to the side of the container, then it's time to get in there and cut off about an inch. You want to cut off those roots that are going horizontally back to roots that are pointing, um, well, also horizontally, but not up against the pot. Okay. 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 Um Here's a question. Do you need male and female plants to produce fruit? I think this is orient geared towards citrus. No? Okay. Are there any of these plants you've discussed that need male and female plants? No. Okay. And they wouldn't be male and female. It's just a cross-pollinization. Like commercially, they will put lemons, sometimes of tangerines, to increase the production of the crop. Pollinization are like great. Okay. That makes sense. You know, all the citrus we have are produce by themselves. Okay. okay. And anything else I've talked about, guavas, getting into bananas, whatever, they're all self-fruitful. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm scrolling through our questions. Okay. We have someone who specifically wants to know about key lime. Do you have any recommendations for key lime? Do we carry, key? we carry key lime, right? Yeah. Yeah. No recommendations for it. Yeah. They kind of same citrus is, is citrus all kind of same care. Yep. I mean, basically all the subtropicals are the same. They, like I said, they, they're a little heavier on the, the miners. That's why ideally you want to get something that's for them. Um, but I mean, if you only have one citrus and you have a bunch of other houseplants, that's where you could use the acid mix if you have a bunch of, you know, other like African violet mix or something like that. You just don't okay. want have anything that has a high nitrogen content on it. You want that first number to be smaller than the second number. Okay, so when you're fertilizing your plants, you want a low, the first number needs to be small low nitrogen? Once they get big. In the beginning, it kind of also depends what the fertilizer is made from. If it's an organic source, that means the nitrogen is slow release. And so like this little stuff here, it comes in a bigger bag. This is specially designed for citrus. It's a 633, which when you look at numbers, you want to look at just the ratio. So that's basically a... Um, um, we just had a class on fertilizer, so I should, yeah. I should know this. <laughs> it's the same as a 2-1-1. One, one. 
Okay. <laughs> it would be the same as a 1266. So it's all of the numbers tell you is how many pounds of a product is in 100 pounds. So there's six pounds of nitrogen and 100 pounds of this fertilizer. But it's the ratios you're concerned about. But if it's an organic based nitrogen source, it's all slow release. And okay. fact, even on the non organic stuff, they've actually mimic the natural stuff by putting in slow release um, non organic sources. So it, it's not all nitrogen at one time. Okay. It, so the um, safe thing would be a lower number, but a lot of the stuff is like that one is 633. Most of them have so, so higher numbers, but it's a all slow release material. Oh so yeah, so look for like a slow release citrus fertilizer or something that's low in nitrogen, like the first number's low. But you don't want gobs of nitrogen. So okay. here I'm seeing- That just encourages yeah. a lot of leaf growth, right? Nitrogen? Nitrogen is there for chlorophyll production. Any nitrogen that's extra that doesn't go into the chlorophyll molecule goes into the chloroplast of the new leaf, which expands and makes the big leaf expand like blowing up a balloon. It doesn't okay. make it matter. You have the same amount of matter. It's just everything's thinner. And so uh, oh, okay. Okay. All right. So too much is not healthy for the plant. No. Okay. Um, let me see here. We Okay. We had a bunch of questions on... Moving the citrus in and out and overwintering. Um, so we had, let me see if I had the most detailed question here. We, we've had a lot come in. Um, okay, this person, Susan, is saying, I have a question about lemons specifically, but we've had a few people ask generally about other citrus. I've killed three since moving here from California in the 80s, despite having an actual glass conservatory, they always start to decline after I move the container inside for the winter. We've had two other people say, whenever I bring the plants inside for the winter, the leaves turn yellow and fall off. So do you know why that is? Is that a common issue? The thing that you want to be careful about is when you bring it inside any plant, <laughs> you have to re-examining the watering process. Okay. Um, they might not use as much water when they're inside because there's no wind, okay? They need less water when they're indoors. Yeah, and um, citrus can handle our tap water in the wintertime, but other tropicals, subtropicals, it's like I tell people with houseplants, you do not want to use your tap, cold tap water in the winter, it's too cold. That because it's too cold. Yeah, I had someone tell me, it's like, how do you like having a really freezing cold shower? <laughs> right. And so that is why a lot of people say, well, I, 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 I go ahead and get my water in my container and then I put it and I leave it out to get it room temperature. Room temperature would be minimum. Um, to, to, and that it would be fine. If your plant, for some reason, the soil is quite dry, I will actually use warm water. Sometimes I'll actually boil water in my little tea kettle, pour some into the, you know, in, a, in my water thing I'm going to use, and then we'll add cold water to it and get my finger temp finger in there. And if it's nice and warm from my finger, but not hot, then that's okay because our skin temperature on our finger is well below 98.6. Okay. And the warmer the soil, the warmer the water, higher the temperature of the water, the lower the surface tension. So warm water will penetrate a dry soil quicker if you need to water a dry plant. If you use cold water, it'll pass through. It has surface tension, it's gonna beat up and go right through it. But the expensive, that's what happened with my papaya, was that I was just watering it with tap water and without warming it up at all. And it just kept the soil too cool and it just, the top was fine, but the roots got so cold they rotted and this, the thing fell over. Oh, wow. Okay, so, um, that would be something, you know, now, um, one thing I do to tell people about checking for moisture, you can buy moisture meters and use them in potting soils. Mm -hmm. You can check at different levels because the, the meter only checks the very base of the meter. You'll see this little plastic ring usually, and that's where, it, so if you shove it all the way to the bottom and it registers moist, oh, I'm done, it's fine but you come up a half an inch or an inch and it's dry there because the very bottom of the pot is going to stay the moistest, the longest. So you want to check it in several different heights of your pot. I like to use a chopstick or a wooden dowel or a little bamboo stick and you just shove it in into the pot or even use this outdoors. You just pound it in the ground 
leave it there for 12 hours or so, pull it out, and it'll tell you exactly where the water is because it's going to absorb into that little um, bamboo or wooden stick. That's a good, that's a very good idea. Um, okay, while we're on the topic of watering, is watering from the bottom of the pot a good way to water tropical plants? Is uh, that better or does it not know, matter? Uh, I would say you could do that, but it's better to water from the top. Okay. Because then you're going to get the whole profile nice and moist, plus you want your main watering should be in the sink or outdoors or the bathtub. Okay. You cheat occasionally and water when it's just sitting there. But you do want to flush the water through to take excess salts out, either from your own water or from when you fertilize. There's some you don't want to have salt build up on your stuff out of the soil by watering from the top for these plants. Um, okay, I've two. I've had a couple of questions come in about overnight temperatures. Uh, I'll read one from Anne. My dwarf key lime tends to turn yellow early in the fall before I bring it indoors in mid-October. It greens up again once it comes indoors. Is the soil too cold outdoors? Should I bring it inside sooner? Well, I don't know where you are, but idea, I mean, if you want to keep your um, citrus pumping and going, you really want to bring it inside um, if, definitely at 50 degrees at night. At 50 degrees, okay. Citrus can tolerate lower than that. I grew up with citrus in California where it would get down into the 30s. Yeah. Um, the issue is, is that um, where I, the if you've got a little citrus on your tree that aren't ripe and it gets too cold for it, it might cause them to drop off. Okay. So it's just keep the temp nighttime temperature a fifty or above. Okay, so they are going to prefer to come in once the temperatures start getting in below fifty. Especially key limes. Key limes are one of the more cold sensitive. Citrus. Okay. Limes are the most sensitive. Lemons are next, hardy, and then it goes to oranges, then it goes to tangerines. Kumquats are some of the hardiest and most cold tolerant of them. Okay. 50 degrees. Uh, would be a thanks. My grandmother grew up, uh, her family worked in orange groves when she was a kid, so, but I, I don't know all this. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Here's, here's a question back relating to the leaf drop. So this person says, I've lost leaves on half my lemon tree, but don't see any pests. So it could be the watering issue, but um, their plant is in an east facing window and the, it's specifically the part getting the most sun that's dropping leaves. So do you think that's still a watering issue or do you think there's something, might be something else at play? It's hard to say. The, if they were growing it outdoors in a full sun situation, that doesn't sound right to me. If they were growing it in a bright indirect light and then put it in an eastern window where the eastern window is now full sun, um, that sunlight coming through that window is sometimes almost more intense than it just outdoors. So that might have something to do with it. It might need it, the heat. It's like kind of like a magnifying. I, I uh, fried a succulent one time that way, actually. I yeah. put it too close to the window and it it like got bleached and died. It was very strange. Yeah. Um, Okay, next question. So for the fruits on these trees, what makes new fruit fall off? Like if it doesn't set properly, um, does it, what makes it fall off the tree? Just the pollinization did not result in proper, we'll call it fertilization. Got even, it. Even on your seedless fruit, um, they need to have uh, enough stimulation through pollination on the pollen tube, which grows down through the style of the female part to stimulate the fruit to form. If they don't get the right stimulation, the plant's gonna go no good and it'll dry. That's what I was talking about. That's why you wanna wait until the fruits are about the size of a standard marble before you even think about thinning anything because it's just, we, in, in the fruit industry, we call it June drop. Because in most places outdoors, it would happen sometime around June where you get all the things that aren't going to actually fulfill on the plant. Okay. The plants decided to get rid of them. They don't so want that's to... the point at which you figure out which ones are like viable. Yeah, it's... And, and it's normal for that to happen because you can actually, I've actually gone up and, you know, well, that one looks a little funny. I just tap it and it just falls off and then the other one stays on. But, okay. So you don't want, you don't ever want to expect to have every flower produce a fruit because it's just going to be too much fruit for the plant. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds good. Cause it sounds like this person says, am I doing something wrong? If this happens, there are only two or three fruit on the whole tree. So I guess depending on the size of the tree, that's actually, that would be just fine. Yeah. Probably normal. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm scrolling back up. There was another question I had forgotten. Sorry guys. I'm going trying to, uh, compile questions that we're seeing a lot of them. So if I'm not getting to your question, we will do our best. Um, all right, we talked about winter temperature recommendations. Uh, okay, we have a couple questions about potting. Um, if you're gonna repot your tree, is there a specific time that you should be repotting it in the year? Um, I, ideally, you'd wanna do it in late dormancy, which would be March. Okay. Okay, so March, all right. It could, it could technically be done any time. It's just that if you do it during a flowering period, it might shock it enough that it's going to drop off, you know, some flowers and stuff. But it's all dependent, you know, how desperate you are to transplant and realize, oh, I might lose a crop this year. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to jump back to the top and start going through questions. I see we've got some on different fruits. So we'll just see how many we can get to if that works for you, Paul. <laughs> um, for the neem oil, I know you showed two types of it. Is there one, do you dilute it or do you just use the spray on? And how often do you need to apply neem oil? Well, this is a ready to use. That's, that one's, yes. So you're paying for water and a sprayer, okay? This is concentrate, you mix this with water. The important thing is, is that when you spray your plants, you have to spray the underside of the leaves. So it can be a little difficult. Can't turn this upside down and get underneath the leaf. So you either have to, raise the plant up so you can spray it or uh, sometimes people will take uh, uh, and wrap up the pot if you can lift the pot up and wrap it and put the newspaper on top of it and wrap it up in a plastic bag or something like that and then you can someone has to hold it and tip it upside down so you can spray the underside when people only when you when you have a plant and you're doing this and spraying like this you're only getting the top of the leaf well most insects are on the underside of the leaf so you got to get the underside of the leaf in some manner. So these are convenient to, you know, in theory, but a, a, a pump sprayer, and they come in, you can get little tiny pump sprayers, just manual little tiny things if you want. They're pressurized, so you can actually, as long as you, and the tips are many times are um, adjustable, so you can turn it from being this direction to this direction, so it'd be easier to spray. But however you wanna do it, you do need to make sure you spray the underside of the leaf. And when you spray, you spray to drip. No beyond, if you start getting stuff dripping off your plant, you don't need to spray it anymore. Okay. It's a waste of product. Okay. Um, instead of citrus fertilizer, what do you think of a mild vinegar solution applied monthly in addition to general purpose fertilizer? Adding vinegar to the soil? Yeah, like a mild vinegar solution. Uh, you want to be very careful because it's an, it is an acid and suppose you'd be acidifying the soil but I, I don't see any real purpose in that but I have never investigated using vinegar on plants okay uh, we use to kill insects instead of the soil yes I've definitely done that um okay next question does it make sense to try and grow pineapple from seeds I find the seeds when I cut the fruit um that would, you can try it but I don't know if those are viable That's, okay Pineapple production is done from the tops. Um, there are different varieties. And so, yes, some might have come from seed, but it's going to be hard for it. But a lot of times you get um, sports, just like on citrus. The, the citrus, um, that was one of the, another thing I grew when I started. If you ever find a, when you find a citrus seed, if you want to, it's the white coat. If you can peel that white coat off and then actually look at the seed, Normally, you would expect to have two cotyledons. On a lot of citrus, you will find, well, that looks weird because I see kind of two big ones, but then over here, I see this weird other stuff, and you can pop those off, and those are actually poly, um, those are our seeds formed from the mother tissue, and if you plant those, in theory, you're going to get an exact duplicate of the mother plant. The larger cotyledons are going to be the sexually uh, exchanged, so it'll be variable. But a lot of citrus produce um, 
poly, hold on. Poly embryonic embryos. Um, example, uh, navel oranges are seedless, except for the seeds that you occasionally find in a navel orange. If you find any seeds in a navel orange, it's not uh, from any kind of pollination thing. It's just from the mother plant. And you can plant those. And many times when you plant citrus seeds, you'll get multiple little plants coming out of one seed. That means you have multiple polymeric plants. Um, the more vigorous ones are usually the from the mother plant. But if you plant a navel orange seed, if you find one, it's going to come up and produce a navel orange. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, okay, let's see. I've got, we may have more questions we can get to you guys, but we'll do our best. <laughs> How big of an indoor pot do we need for pineapples? Oh, they don't need a really big one. Um, you would start uh, maybe on a, you can start as small, small as a four inch, fill that up, go to a six. And eventually you probably want to get it into somewhere around a 10 or 12 inch pot. And that's about it. Do you know if we have pineapples at the store right now? We don't. And the pineapples we have at the store are going to be miniature pineapples. Oh, okay. Yeah, the little ones. I see them. Yeah, the fruits are going to be about the size of a tangerine. Okay, yeah. I've seen them, and I was not sure if they were just, like, little baby pineapples or if they were miniature. They're, um, miniature they're just, so cute. You can eat them, but not going to be a lot there. It's tiny. <laughs> okay. Um, I have regular orange and lemon trees that I got from a friend. They appear to be in regular potting soil. Should I transplant them to the cactus soil or can I add bark, shale, et cetera, to the existing soil? I believe they've been in their current pots for some time and they barely bloom. Um, that's where you might consider um, taking them out and examining the soil. And then maybe um, the thing is, is that uh, when you have potting soil, most potting soils are all made from organic products. And especially in lar the larger the container they are, what happens is that that organic matter eventually starts to break down and it can actually create a, a, a barrier at the bottom of the uh, root area. And that stays really wet and doesn't let water through. It can start killing off roots. If the soil stays too wet, you might also get um, anaerobic um, decomposition without oxygen and you can produce nitric and ox uh, Nit nitric and sulfuric oxides, which can also gas root systems. So, the yes, I'd probably recommend um, taking and repotting that. You keep it in the same size pot, but probably taking out, removing all the, any kind of thick gummy soil. You want a, a looser mix, and then repotting it. Um, the like I said, depending on where you are, uh, which available you. Like I said, our potting soil that we sell, our Miraflow makes in a, you know, like a six or eight inch pot would be fine. You could go ahead and add some of the, um, the expanded shale or clay or products if you want to, maybe some of the um, charcoal, which would help out too. Um, if you're going to be growing them in like 15 gallon bigger containers, then that's where you want to use, um, definitely put in some of the permatil or whatever. This is not an edible plant. I had to find it for you, but this has these little round clay um, beads. And this is similar. There are products that are like this. Some of them are, are more irregular, but any of the expanded clays or um, shale and stuff, like I said, even uh, perlite would be okay um, to add oxygen to the soil, which they like very much and help keep it more open. All right, I am typing, sorry, a couple of information. Okay, for some of you who I don't think we're going to get to your questions, I'm typing you to email me. Um, if we don't get to your questions today, you are welcome to email me. You can hit reply to your confirmation email. Um, contact me, or my email is esperos at mgcml.com for you guys who don't know it. Uh, but hit, hit reply on your confirmation email that goes to me or call the store, come in. Uh, lots of options. Um, okay. We have time for one or two more. Uh, for figs, do fig trees require special soil like citrus? Do they need a special potting soil? No, I really no. Okay. I'll go for right. anyone. Um, let's see. Ooh, trying to get to some that 
Okay, I'm getting a lot of questions about neem oil, so I'm going to come back to this. Um, can you use insecticidal soap and then neem oil together? Uh, I don't see the point. Okay. As I mentioned before, insecticidal soap is just a desiccant. It dries out the plant, and that's it. There's no contact action. Okay. It just dries out the, the insect or the egg. Uh, where that's why I like Nemo because that's a dual action product. Um, you also want to be careful about using insecticidal soap repeatedly, repeat, repeat, repeat on certain plants because it is a soap and it can start eroding away the um, waxy cuticle on your plants. And it's not recommended for certain plants like certain cactus and stuff because um, it can burn. The, so the Nemo I think is a little better product so okay. Grounded. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is a question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna th get to. I think. Uh, here's here's. But I wanna I wanna ask it because I think it's important for potting stuff. This is from Eva. She says I've heard that citrus doesn't like too big a pot, so you shouldn't just bring it home and repot it to the maximum size pot that you want right away. Uh, what are your feelings on on pot size? Like basically having a pot that's maybe way larger than the root system of the plant. So the deal with that is you think about, wait a minute, if I'm in, a, if I'm in an area I can grow citrus, i.e. Florida, parts of California, and you go to the nursery and you buy this little, you know, three gallon citrus and you go home and you plant it outside. Well, your pot outside is huge because it's the earth, okay? The difference is that when you, when you plant it outside, it's usually mineral soil, not all that organic -y soil. If you do put a small plant in a big pot and everything goes well, it's just going to going to want to grow bigger. It's not going to when you when a plant is slightly stressed, it tends to want to produce flowers. If it has everything it needs to get bigger, root space, nutrients, water, it will opt not to flower or even maybe flower, but drop those flowers off because it goes, I can get bigger. If I can get bigger, I'm gonna have more offspring eventually and do my job. By keeping that plant in that smaller container, you're going to get flowers and fruit earlier. So it's it's kind of a managing thing, you know, and how big do I want to get my my tree? That's, does that sound good for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, it is 102 guys, so we're gonna have to call it for the day. I'm sorry, I know we have more questions coming in than we were able to get to. Um, for uh, those of you who still have questions for us, please feel free to send me an email. You can also call any of our three stores uh, and Paul is at the Fair Oaks store and I'm sure he would be happy for you all to stop by. Um, so we are happy to, to get with you and answer questions. And just to be clear, if you email me, I will connect you with Paul or with another member of our team. Uh, I, I, will, I do not answer questions that I do not know the answer to. <laughs> so you don't need to worry about that. But um, Paul, thank you so much. Uh, I've learned a lot about growing citrus since we always took it for granted growing up. We just all had citrus trees in the ground already, but um, this was great. Uh, There's couple, one, yeah. one thing. I sort of bypassed it real quick, talking about guavas and stuff, which are hard to find. But one of the fun things I did as a kid, I mean, I still do, I plant my mango seeds. Any of your subtropical tropicals you buy at the store, if you actually find a seed, like the person asked about a pineapple, if you actually found a pineapple seed, go ahead and plant it, see what happens. Yeah, we've done that with avocado. Um, yeah, that's fun. Uh, okay, sorry, what was I gonna say? Oh. This Saturday, for anybody who is interested, uh, Larry Shapira is going to be at the Fair Oaks store. He's a professor, for, a retired professor from um, Nova Community College, and he will be teaching seed starting, how, um, the basics for anybody who's interested in learning how to start seeds for vegetables or flowers. That's a great class to attend. That's 10 a.m. on Saturday. I will be following up on this class with a coupon uh, and an email. And please do let us know if you have any suggestions for topics, uh, anything you want to hear from us about in person, on Zoom. Uh, we're, we're planning actively for really the later spring and summer at this point. So we'd love to hear from you guys. And Paul, thank you so much for, for joining us today to talk about this. All right. Uh, do you want to wrap up with anything? Any last words of wisdom before we close? 
Have fun. All right. That's good. Everybody have a great day and we will see you soon.